Well, greetings, friends. Danielle Smith, president of Alberta Enterprise Group. And you will notice that I do quite a number of segments on environmental companies. And there's a reason for that. One of the big lobbying priorities that we put forward is trying to get a way of accelerating well site reclamation to build on what happened during the COVID period when we got a billion dollars from the federal government to do reclamation. Great, but there was a lot of downhole abandonment that got done. Remember how this works? I know most of you are in the industry, but for those of you who aren't, there's sort of three parts of the reclamation process. One is that you do the downhole abandonment, and then the second part is you do the surface reconstruction. So you're trying to get it back to normal, and then you have to watch it for a couple of years to make sure that the vegetation management part works so that the soil returns to its natural condition or pretty close to it. And then you can get a well site in theory, you can get a reclamation certificate and then it's off your books. This has part of been part of the problem. It's part of the reason why I've backed the Sustaining Alberta's Energy Network proposal to get a, a royalty tax credit because we figured that we could try to find a way of working all the way through the process so that at the end of the line, the, the well sites are returned to the natural condition, can be transferred off to the Orphan Well Association for future stewardship in the event that there's some problem that needs to be returned to. And we'd be able to, to tackle this some $30 billion liability in a, a meaningful way that goes right across the, the chain. Now, that uh, brings me to my next guest. We, we have talked before with uh, PSAC, who does a lot of this work. We've talked with Blackfly Environmental as well. I'm not sure if we've talked to Dave. I think we did, Winterhawk and a few others that are doing some really interesting work on surface reclamation. And my next guest is uh, no exception. His name is Mike Myshak, and he is president of Long Chain Reclaim. He's going to tell us a little bit more about the work that he does. It's very exciting work. Mike, thanks so much for being with me today. Thank you, Danielle. Good morning. And it's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here with the legendary Danielle Smith. <laughs> no, you are the legend. I can't wait. People are going to feel the same way I do as soon as they, they hear about your company. I brag about you all the time. I told you that last time I see you. So I want to make sure that I've got all my facts straight on it. So I want to know a little bit of the history about um, about mm -hmm. your family businesses, because this is one that you've, you've uh, you struck out on your own, but, but you've got a long history in working in this industry. So tell me a little bit about that. Sure. So um, I guess, you know, born and raised into the, to the MyShack family, uh, the MyShack group of companies uh, came from that crane and heavy haul black background. Um, I guess I started at an early age uh, through, you know, school on uh, summer holidays in the wash bay, building crane mats, um, got into my class one and trucking. And then shortly after high school, I started my crane apprenticeship. Um, I did leave the, the nest. And I joined a company by the name Morley Parsons Cord. I did a three year, two, three year stint in Fort McMurray for the Husky Sunrise project and finished off my, uh, my mobile crane ticket. Um, after that, I was, I went into sales and rentals, uh, project estimating, and then business development. Um, so that was kind of my, my chain and my, my learning ladder, I guess, as you will with my shack group. And, uh, and then I kind of evolved into, uh, into environmental with, uh, with an opportunity that came across our plate. Well, I'm going to talk a little more about that, but l let's talk about what you saw over the, the the last number of years. Because for for those who who don't know the industry, I think that there's sort of an expectation that that you would uh, develop a well site, and then if it's no longer producing, it would very quickly get re re reclaimed and returned to its natural condition, and then you would move on. Now, I've been surprised to learn. I talked to somebody who got into the energy sector, hoping to be able to do environmental work. And they said for 25 years, they didn't do any reclamation. And then this last year, they become quite expert at it. So give me your sense of, of where the industry is at. Like what, what has been the problem in the past in really accelerating some of this reclamation work? You know, I guess, I guess there, there would be a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of red tape in, in my opinion, you know, I haven't been in the, the environmental realm. I've only started, I guess, in, 2020 is when I got into the environment. Um, you know, our our kind of holdback to to the market is uh, is knowing if the technology works or if it doesn't work. You know, we get that question quite often. Um, you know, does the crap work and how much does it cost? Those are the those are the questions. And uh, and there is a stigma on bioremediation, and that's that's kind of the barrier that we are trying to break through uh, to be accepted. Now, you know, we've done. You know, multiple sites, the, the technology, our specific technology has been around since, you know, field trials were in 2009. And uh, we've proven the efficacy out multiple times. But uh, there there are other 
other techs and other technologies for Bauer Media Ocean there that, that quite frankly don't work. Okay, well, let's then talk about that term that you're using, bioremediation, because it must be differentiated from some of the other techniques, and we'll hear about those. But tell us what bioremediation is. So essentially, bioremediation is using bacteria uh, to get rid of uh, hydrocarbon molecules and contamination. So there's, you know, there's multiple different strains and different family groups of bacteria. So uh, we use what is called uh, the Pseudomonas family group. And what was traditionally found in the past was uh, they would be used, they would use um, a bacillus. So like I said before, there's thousands of these strains in each family group. Um, Key differences, I guess, between the bacillus and the the pseudomonas is uh, the bacillus can, they can go dormant. They, if they ever feel endangered, like if the temperature is too high or too cold or the pH is off, uh, they activate what's called a spore and that spore acts as a protective layer and it protects them and they can lay dormant like that for a hundred years. So Mm -hmm. that enabled manufacturers to take these bacteria, put them into a container, put them, it gives them a shelf life. You bring them to site, rip open the bag, hydrate them, and they'll start their process. Now, what they wouldn't tell the, the, the buyers or the end users is that the bacillus can only assimilate the shape of like a vegetable oil or an animal fat type grease, not a mineral oil or petroleum grease. So you wouldn't get full degradation, right? Because they can't assimilate the shape of a hydrocarbon. So that was one of the key, you know, things of old tech and compared to our tech, which is, you know, extremely important to understand. Um, they, they quite frankly cannot degrade hydrocarbon. Let's uh, take one step back because it may come as a surprise to people that there are bacteria in nature that can act as almost a natural cleanup to clean up hydrocarbons. I'd heard of this before in ocean spills uh, and it kind of came as a surprise to me because of course everybody's very concerned about ocean spills. I understand that. But one of the things that came out of some of the reporting is that a lot of that um, uh, oil that does get spilled uh, is eaten up by by natural bacteria, and so I mean, what is the what is the range of opportunity here? Because I, I think that per, just connecting that dot, because I, as we get into looking at some of the alternatives, I just want to make sure that people fully understand the uh, the opportunity for for the kind of technology you're talking about. Well, absolutely. The, you know, the opportunity is huge. Uh, you're absolutely correct. The the there's a lot of indigenous bacteria. The, you know, the microbes that I just talked about and the ones that we use are found in nature. Um, but yeah, they can be used anywhere from you know any kind of body of water, fens, streams, rivers, lakes, oceans, even uh, and soil. You know, as long as their nutrient source is there, uh, they can they can degrade it. So. Um, you know, the opportunity going, but touching back on that is, you know, everything from brown fields, uh, sumps, oil wells, oil spills, you know, anything hydrocarbon contaminated, we can do. Okay. Let's then talk a bit about how you got into this partnership. Tell me, tell me a, a little bit about the person who did de- developed your, your next stage technology. Sure. Absolutely. So we, we had a civil, civil company, uh, that we tried to get going with, uh, with another partner, uh, a few years back. Uh, we had the Aspen project up in Fort McMurray that got shelved. We went from, you know, 300 employees down to six and we had a bunch of equipment sitting around no utilization so we started to you know network with our with our group of peers and and we got introduced to a fellow by the name of marlon rudolph who invented the product um we sat down and you know did the presentation uh, a light bulb went off when i seen his technology i'm like holy cow this is you know this is huge and i laughed because you know when i when i left the the my shack group and i started working with marlon um, it was it was the end of 2019, and then 2020, the SRP program came out, and you know a lot of my colleagues were like you knew you know there was there was you know you had to have had an inside loop, and I'm like I never. It's just there's you know you you realize a huge problem, and then you know an opportunity like this falls into your lap. It's pretty amazing. Just excellent um, timing. So tell me, what did he show you that made you realize that this could be game changing? What because I'm picturing uh, petri dishes in the <laughs> laboratory and these little bacteria gobbling it up. But what what was the what, what, how did you know this was going to be so different? So honestly, I guess it was just, uh, it was, it was just a slideshow and, um, and, you know, he explained, you know, the bacteria and what was different and kind of just what I'm, what I'm explaining to you. Um, and I, you know, I thought it was amazing. And I, so I did my due diligence over, you know, it was, that was probably midway through 2019 is when I met him. And then I did my due diligence. I went on site, you know, I executed a project with him. Um, you know, I seen the invoices get paid, you know, I looked through the financials, everything made, made perfect sense 
and uh, and to see the success at doing it myself, I was like, this is a is a no brainer, you know, and for how easy it was, and you know how little ground disturbance that particular job was. Like it was uh, it was an old pipeline break. Um, they they already did the they already did the the pipeline fix, of course, but it was in a marshy lands full of trees, spruce. And uh, we never had to bring any, you know, excavators or anything in there. We just went in with a simple, very sophisticated tooling piece of copper pipe and a and a garden hose, and we strung it out there, mixed our solution, and we literally just pushed it into the the muskeggy ground and navigate our way through the trees. So, you know, very little ground disturbance, uh, no disturbance to the trees or, or nature, and uh, and away we went. So it just made perfect sense. Talk, talk to me about what would have had to ha happen if you didn't have this technology. What are some of the options? Because it sounds to me like there is a bit of a current standard of practice that doesn't necessarily use this type of technology. So I'm wondering what the al the alternative is. You talk about bringing in excavators. Is it is it really that simple that you just remove, you, you just come in, dig up the soil, remove it? Yeah, so that's that's primarily what is chosen because it's it's quick and easy and it and it's and it's certain, right? You know, once all the all the contaminations are gone, you haul back in some clean fill and you you wipe your hands clean, and everybody goes back to work. Now, it's also the more cost of cost cost, you know, it's more costly, of course, uh, because of the equipment. Typically, you know, there's tipping fees at these facilities where you have to drop off the contaminated soil and there's different classes of landfills. Uh, the trucking is also huge, right? So you got the, the ESG component on that as well. Um, but so that's one option. And that's Before you leave that, what happens to the soil when it's taken away and landfilled? Is it is it remediated in any way or is it just buried? Some, 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 depending on the facility, there, there are facilities that, uh, that do bioremediation uh, as they claim. And, you know, we don't know all their secrets, um, but to my understanding, uh, it's basically soil manipulation. So you have different, different lengths of hydrocarbon chain. You have your BTEX, which is your benzene, toluene, ethylbenzene, and xylene. And then the fractions go from F1 to F4. So F1 is being your your very light, volatile, kind of like a WD-40. Your F2 would be like a motor oil. Your F3 would be like a gear oil. Your F4 would be like a roofing tar. So the longer the, the hydrocarbon chain, um, the harder it is to degrade. Now, the, so then the, you would get, you'd get like um, the less, the more volatile short chain hydrocarbons will go to a facility where they can manipulate it. They can do bio augmentation, utilizing bacteria, adding fertilizers or you know, cow manure, stirring it up. But what you're actually getting is you're getting the volatile hydrocarbons to essentially flash off. So you manipulate it and then and then once it gets down below criteria, then you can repurpose it. So yes, they are doing it. But what but a lot of the these like oil spills or the long chain hydrocarbons what can't just flash off and you can't get rid of them. They're stuck there. Those will go to a landfill and essentially be stored for forever. Okay. So that, so that's one mechanism then removing it and either landfilling it or treating as much as you can. When, when the soil gets retreated or it gets treated off site, does it then get returned? Can it then be repurposed? I believe so. Yeah. If it meets criteria, it can. Yeah. Okay. So then what's the, what's another method that would be an alternative? So you could do like chemical oxidation, you know, sending peroxide or other chemicals into the soil and hoping that it, it, it uh, remediates the problem. And what would be some of the drawbacks of that? Uh, it makes chemical reaction, right? Um, you know, the ground, I, I, I don't know it personally, but I, I've heard that, the, you know, the ground gets very hot. Um, there's other byproducts, chemical reactions that, that happen, um, and I, I couldn't list them. Okay, so yeah. the, are those the two other main competitors that you have, or is there another option people would be using? Yeah, there's there's like thermal desorption where you can, you know, you can extract all the soil, put it through like a big burner unit, uh, essentially cook off all the hydrocarbons. Um, there you're left with a very powder type soil where if you want to reuse it, you would have to re-add nutrients to it. Um, that's a fairly big footprint for, for a system like that. Um, you know, there's phyto remediation that you don't hear much of that's utilizing plants. Um, but that's, you know, those are, those are the main ones. Okay, so it sounds to me like almost every other option requires quite a bit of extra work, labor, equipment, uh, earth moving, return, chemical processes. Yours actually sounds pretty simple and pretty cost effective by comparison. So I would. So what am I missing? <laughs> well, don't get me wrong. We got a couple different processes. That what I've what I've 
illustrated to you already is the in situ process, which we have as of late taken it to, to higher levels. Uh, we do also have ex situ process. So depending on the site condition, the depth of the concentration, the inorganic and organic data that we receive from the phase two, from the environmental consultant or the client, then we determine the process that we use. So, you know, if we were to do ex situ, yes, we would still excavate it because the, the bugs do need oxygen, right? So, hmm. uh, so if you don't have the proper oxygen, you're going to have to, we're going to have to excavate it and run it through our machine. Our ECM machine is what we call it, it's an earth cleaning machine. But then too, you know, that treat, that'll treat a thousand cubic meters a day. Um, you know, but when you speak about the price, yeah, we, we're, we're extremely cost effective. Like we're, you know, to be humble, we're typically 20 to 40% cheaper uh, than, than any alternative method, or we could do 20 to 40% more sites on the same budget. So give me an idea when you say that you, you talked about the first one that you had done, how do you know it's successful? What is the method that you use to test before and after? Um, so, so give me, give me some idea of what, uh, when you, when you did roll it out, what, uh, what did you discover? Sure. So what will happen is, so we typically get invited um, by the consultant uh, onto site, right? So you have your waste generator uh, or whoever owns the liability uh, they'll typically have a, a consultant on retainer that they like to use for any of these things. Um, so they they all so that that consultant will typically say, okay, look here here are your options. These are your remediation options, and let the let the client pick it. Uh, to my to my understanding, anyways. Um, so then we'll come in as a, as a contractor. We'll provo- we'll provide our services, the remediation, and then and then we will give them kind of a timeline on on when they need to, to pull samples and check the soil, make sure it reached criteria. Uh, so that is that is completely separate. That's third party, uh, independent, and uh, they'll take the samples and then mm-hmm. give you a yay or nay, right? You know there there are times where you get hot spots, you know, um, where you know like like for example the one I just did in Fort McMurray in in, uh, in June. There was 8,000 cubic meters of contaminated soil, predominantly, you know, F3s and F4 fractions. So the hardest ones to to degrade, uh, if if at all possible. And uh, we uh, we took that. We tested in September because the client needed to turn the the property over in a timely fashion. So we treated in June, tested in September, and we had 525 cubic meters left dirty out of 8,000 cubic meters. That's remarkable. Do you know yeah. what went wrong in the 525 cubic meters? Is it, is it just I'm trying to understand it? Cause it sounds, there's a couple layers that we've got to deal with here. So sure. first let me ask, get you, get you to answer that question. That's a, a really high success rate. So that's less than 10% that had to be revisited. But what, what do you think was the reason why um, that that was an outlier? So that could have been like a million parts per million of hydrocarbons. Like it could have been straight diesel, right? Mm-hmm. Um, whereas, you know, the other levels, because when you're, when you get the phase two data, you know, they have boreholes all over the place, but you know, in between borehole A and borehole B, there could be five meters. Well, not knowing what's in between those five meters, well, that could be pure diesel. Whereas at A, it's 42,000 parts per million and B, it's at 20,000 parts per million. Right in between there could be a million parts per million. So even though the, even though we inject every meter squared, well, you got you could have a couple hot spots left. So and so what do you do when you have those hot spots? Can, I mean, can, do you just revisit them, or do they have to be dealt with a different way? You can definitely revisit them. Uh, of course, uh, of course, you know it's going to cost equipment and manpower. Like I mm-hmm. said, the bugs the bugs will do their thing. Um, you can just leave it. Time time will time in time they will take care of it because they will not stop mineralizing hydrocarbons until there's none left. So we could get down to that non-tact. So, That's and they, so that, yeah, they'll just go, go, go. And then once they, you know, once they finish mineralizing all the hydrocarbons, they cannibalize. All right. So th- then l- let's talk about the different types of hydrocarbons. Cause it sounds like your process is effective uh, on all of, of the different types and the it, whole it, spectrum. it is interesting. Yeah. And, and to, and to what depth, I mean, because I, I have to understand a little bit more about the nature of the type of, of, of spills and the nature of the type of contamination that you're dealing with. I, I mean, I remember years ago, I visited a particularly bad site in, in central Alberta that was a, a million dollar cleanup. And it was because there was a leak that happened at the low level and then it migrated. And so it was a massive pit that I went and visited. So I can I know that some of these can be pretty dr- dramatic rec- reclamations that you have to do. But what would be a, what would be a typical problem? Why would would there be um, hydrocarbon spills at all on well sites? What, what are the things that you're finding? 
Well, you know, you could probably have, you know, uh, something pop loose and, and have, you know, oil spilling out. Um, you know, pipeline breaks are huge. Uh, gas stations, you know, that type of thing. Old fueling stations. Uh, there's always spillage, you know, uh, on sites like this. Uh, leaky tanks, you know, you name it. It could be a truck rollover. And could you use it for any type of spill, no matter how? I mean, what's the how many how many different sites have you done? I want to sort of get a range of what you've been able to to successfully use it on. So since I've joined the team, we have done you know residential, industrial, uh, commercial. You know, um, we've done oil field, and uh, and the pipeline break. Ah, so you know yeah. now that and I'm that's, thinking... and that's sorry, sorry to interrupt. And that's myself. Yeah. You know, Marlin's like I mentioned before. Marlin, he created the technology in 2003, 2009. He did his field trials, and then he's been to work ever since. He's done over 80 projects in North America. That's amazing. You know, it's funny. I I started off thinking, oh, this is going to be so great for well site reclamation, but now you're sort of broadening my thinking about the other places that you'd use it. Tell me about a residential application. Why would somebody have a problem on their on their home? So they had a tidy tank stored in between the two homes and that tidy tank had a hole in it. So the neighbor, no one knew that the tank was leaking. The neighbor could smell diesel in their basement. Um, so instead of, you know, excavating all the soil around these two homes and the foundations, we just came in and, and drilled in between and that was it. What would be, how much money did you save them? It sounds like the other alternative would have been pretty costly. Yes, it definitely would have. I, I didn't work out the numbers, but, <laughs> uh, but the, 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 the homeowner was very happy that they, uh, that they chose us. Over and that's a, so tell me again, uh, so tell me about industrial. When I think about some of the industrial sites that would be a problem, I guess the things that come to mind are these gas station sites. It's always been remarkable to me that you see a gas station that ends up getting shut down and then the lots it's vacant for years mm -hmm. or decades. There's some that have been sitting for decades. And I, now that I'm thinking a, a little more about your, your uh, application, I'm, I'm wondering if you can accelerate that. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, you own that liability cradle to grave, right? So sometimes the people that own these properties don't mind holding on to it. It's, you know, it, it doesn't pay, I guess it does if with your asset liability ratio, it kind of pays off that way. Um, but, it, you know, when you're spending money to clean up a contaminated site, you're not making money on that unless, mm -hmm. of course, you, you revitalize it. And sometimes people have no interest. Um, but yes, exactly that. There's you know, in, in a lot of communities, Stony Plain, you know, where I'm, where I'm, where I live, where I reside, uh, there are properties that I know are contaminated. Now to try to, you know, I've reached out to the owners and said, Hey, look, you know, either a, let me take this liability off you and I'll treat it myself, mm -hmm. you know, and, and hopefully flip the property or B, let me help you resolve the problem. And they would rather just have mm -hmm. somebody check the groundwater monitoring wells, make sure the contamination is not getting into the groundwater. And they pay someone to do that month to month or bi-weekly or quarterly, how it depends on how that consultant uh, pitches it. Ideally, though, it'd be nice if every. I mean, I guess this is what I'm wondering, too, is the, the barriers that you might have to getting um, your technology more broadly adopted. This is one of the things that I hear from a lot of companies. It strikes me that there's a pretty robust ecosystem for new technologies, especially on the environmental front. And the question I'd have is how easy is it to connect the opportunities that you're developing with the, with the customers who, who could benefit from them? Well, it, it, it's, it's not really that easy. You know, like we, we've, we have approached clients or potential clients where we know there's a problem. Um, and we know there's a problem because either A, we supplied mats to it or, or we know clients that have, or we know, you know, uh, colleagues that have equipment on that site. Um, you know, we reach out, we give our information. Um, they're pretty comfortable and we find the problem typically with middle management everything's come every everyone's pretty comfortable where they're at they don't want to stick their neck out for something that might not work right and that's that's what they're they're saying it might not work so you know i like to guarantee them i i said if it doesn't work don't pay me or pay me on a progressive scale like once we get all of these bench parks then pay me you know and you know um but it's just it it's amazing the stuff i've offered and people still say no well, you're still brand new. It's quite remarkable that even though you've only really just entered the scene, that you've had you've had so much work. Is there is there anything uh, government needs to do to to make it easier for companies like yours? Well, that would be huge. You know, if if we could, 
you know, because when I look at, you know, some of these facilities where it's being stored, you know, mm-hmm. it's, it's being stored, it's being covered with, with soil and it sits there. Well, they're, they're on hundred year liners, supposedly. Well, in chemistry, like dissolves like. So in time, these chemical based liners will be, will leak. And then once they leak, they got to dig it up and haul it to another or move it over and put another liner down and, and, and leave it for our grandkids as grandkids. You know, so when you see that and that is allowed, it's kind of, it's kind of irritating because if you can treat this on site, mm-hmm. being the first, like if, if it was, if the policy was changed where if you can treat it on site, first and foremost, that's what you need to do. If you right. can't treat it on site, then haul it to a facility where you can regenerate the soil and reuse it instead of just storing it. Now we can't treat every contamination, right? So there's going to be, there's going to be, you know, landfill uses for, you know, high salinity impacts, heavy metal impacts, that stuff we can't touch. But if there is just a strictly hydrocarbon contaminated site, step one, try to treat it on site. Step two, bring it to a facility where you can treat it and reutilize it. That sounds like an interesting approach because what would be the the benefits of being able to treat on site is it seems to me that there's, we've been talking about the cost side, but there must be environmental benefits from being able to treat on site versus all the disruption you're talking about. Yeah. You know, the, the benefits are you don't have to, you know, pay expensive costs for trucking, you know, cause there ain't a landfill on every corner, like a, like a liquor store in Stony Plain, <laughs> for example. That's right. <laughs> you know, like you have as many liquor stores as we do in High River. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. So you know they're they're quite quite a distance. They're jaunt, right? So sometimes yep. you know you can pay up to you know six hour round trip for one load, right? And they'll haul you know thirty to forty tons per truck. Wow. Okay. So you're talking about not only a cost point of view, but if you're talking about greenhouse gas emissions, you'd be right. able to reduce all of those emissions by reducing that amount of that amount of trucking. Okay. Continue. What are some of the other environmental benefits of, of doing it in situ? So while well, doing it in situ, very little ground disturbance, you know, uh, you, you we basically, it's a three inch bit. We drill it into the ground with our in situ drill that goes on to a mini excavator, 50 G size. So very minimal ground disturbance and mm-hmm. you don't have open excavations. You don't have gathering water. You don't have to pump out any leachate, nothing like that. Right. Um, so you, you eliminate the ESG, minimal ground disturbance and so on and so forth. Well, th- then it, it sounds like you'd also then be able to have the, the land re- uh, on the surface with the vegetation. Do you do anything there once the hydrocarbons are cleaned up? What is the next step to make sure that the the regrowth of the vegetation, whether it's trees, whether it's grass, whether it's fescue, that that, that, that occurs? Yeah, so we, we don't, we just do the remediation. Any of the reclamation or the replanting, uh, we call others for sure. That's another, that's the second step. That's the second step. And there's, there are great companies out there. I think you've introduced me to some of them in the past um, where they would be my first call. And is it, but is it that simple? Uh, once you've done your process, what's the delay before you can start doing the vegetation work? So one of, um, I guess there was a rainbow lake spill. Um, we typically, we don't, we don't speak about our clients because, you know, we're, it's a very discreet uh, business, but now that since this company has went bankrupt, we are allowed to say their name, but Pace Oil and Gas had a, had a large spill up in Rainbow Lake. I think there was about 14 hectares oil. Pilot spotted it from the sky. It was completely black. Um, Alberta Energy Regulators called in Marlin at that time to come and treat it. And simply they they, they sprayed it with a water cannon. They drove around the site on crane mats and they just surfaced application. And then it was within three months. There was not only just swamp grass growing because swamp grass is very you know, hardy stuff, it'll grow in, uh, in these, in these conditions, but there was other flowers growing. So, mm-hmm. you know, that was within just three months. So dependent again on the site conditions and, and every site is different, of course. Um, but you can, you can see plant growth within the months. That's pretty remarkable. And so, mm-hmm. and I, so I guess, let me ask one more question. Cause we've also had, uh, spills that have gotten into water systems. Does, does your technology only work on surface or does it also work on water? The, the wetter, the better. Yeah, they really, really the, the pseudomonas love water. They thrive in water. So um, yeah, no, they, they're extremely well in water and they so, will but, go with the water. Really? So yeah. if there was a spill, I'm, I guess I'm thinking about the one that happened in Saskatchewan where um, everybody was worried that the drinking water downstream was going to be polluted for years. It, are, in those kinds of situations, is, is, is there an ability to come out and then apply your process, this bacteria, so that it does that that first step of reclamation before you end up having to go further. 
Yeah, you could boom off, let's say, the, the flow of water uh, to start collecting, you know, the hydrocarbons or the, or the contaminations. But once you apply the microbes, what they'll do is they'll form CFUs, which is the colony forming unit, and they'll grow. So, you know, in, the, in a presentation, we have pictures where you can see the, the plumes of the colonies forming and growing, and then you can actually see the colonies flowing downstream. Like, uh, it's, uh, it's quite remarkable. No kidding. So what happens yeah. when you say that they'll just keep on going until the hydrocarbons are gone? What happens then? Do they die or do they go dormant? They cannibalize. They, really? So then yeah. they're, they're gone. The, then the bacteria themselves are gone. Yeah. But then the last one's hunting down and uh, hung for manslaughter. So. <laughs> <laughs> Let me talk to you one more thing about the about uh, the depth because you talked about you drilling holes. So we know we have a uh, wet application on in water on surface in marshlands. But what happens if you if you do have a deep spill? What has to happen there? So it, basically excavation. You'd have to excavate it. Now we could still treat it on site. You know we could still run it through our ECM machine on site. So you're eliminating the trucks on the highway. You're eliminating you know your tipping fees so on and so forth. Um, we have successfully treated up to 10 meters deep, um, you know, but we'd like to recommend anything to six to seven meters to ground surface, right? Because like I said before, the, uh, the, they do need an option. Six to seven meters still sounds like it's a, a, a pretty deep. That, that should be able to cover most, most bills, I would think. Yeah, they're, they're roughly around the ground surface to four meters. All right. So just more generally speaking, give me the, the, the sense that you have about the 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 investment ecosystem for environmental companies like yours because i i often worry that especially young kids coming out of school think that the energy sector is just on the on the one side it's about doing the development which is great doing the development making sure the product gets to market but the, i don't know how much they understand that you can work in an energy company and have a, a amazing opportunities on environmental reclamation as well. So, so give me some sense of whether, of how that's developing out and some of the other interesting things that, that you're seeing in this space. Yeah. Like the, the, the opportunity is huge, you know, like there's, there's contaminated sites, not only on, you know, the orphan well association, but you know, some of these oil and gas producers, you know, they have their debt asset liability ratio as you're, you're well aware of, um, you know, to, to, to be able to get, you know, to, to drill more wells or, you know, to, to, to grow their assets, they have to get rid of some of their liabilities. Mm -hmm. Right. So, and some of these clients have purchased land and old wells and, you know, done a, done a quick, you know, 40, $60,000 job on one of these, uh, just to get another rec cert, another rec cert means another well and so on and so forth while they're running out of these small jobs. Right, yeah. they're running out of these small jobs. Pretty soon, there's going to be just the large ones that are remaining, and these are coast to coast, and not only coast to coast, they're they're worldwide. It's a it's a worldwide problem, and uh, the, the the market is huge. The market is huge, and you know, currently, you know, some people already have ninety three percent of that market share here in Western Canada. So trying to diversify that a little bit more. Give me an idea of uh, because that's the sense that I've had as well. I've been a bit worried that the low hanging fruit to be able to reduce the liability, that those are obviously going to be the first ones. But when you say that there's a, these kinds of sites, not just here, but around the world, g give me an idea of what we don't know that we don't know. What, where are the big problems? You know, we've, we've been approached by people in South Africa. Uh, there's, oh, I don't know. Did I lose you? No, you're still there. Can you hear me? Yeah, you betcha. Yeah. Yeah. So you've got, you've been approached by South Africa. South Africa and the UK, um, the Middle East, of course, uh, you know, these, these problems are running rampant. So, uh, you know, in Iraq and Kuwait, you know, there's rumors that the oil is running down the ditches. Now, I don't know if it's true or not, uh, okay. but, uh, but yeah, we've, we've heard stories and, and we've, we've been in conversations with people in places like that. Well, I hope that you have some of those international opportunities. I don't know if you've heard anything. I think I asked you this when I saw you um, uh, because we've got a, a major site in Calgary that has got creosote that is on the surface. Yeah, you know about it. Yeah, so I think that the uh, that particular site, the way they used to put the creosote in the railway ties is that they would dig pits, put the ties in, and then and then and put a bunch of have it soak in creosote. So you can imagine there's a lot of work that needs to be done there. Have you heard of any type of bacteria that might be able to solve that problem? Yeah, it's called Pseudomonas, the ones that we use. What? 
Yeah. So yes. okay, let let's get down to this because you know it's it, it, you probably are an, an Oilers fan, but the uh, the Flames had considered trying to remediate that site so that they could build a combination event center, um, as well as have the a new field house and and uh, stadium there for the st for the Stampeders. But I think that that was the barrier is actually cleaning up that site. Nobody nobody wanted to to take on the huge liability. Is there, I, I don't know enough about creosote to know how it fits in the hydro, hydrocarbon change you're talking about, but are there any, um, is it is it exactly the uh, the same type of process or are there additional elements that make it more difficult to remediate? So the, the, the problem with that site, it is very, it is very deep um, yeah. and it's in, and it started to get into the shale. Now the shale, you would need to add other nutrients in with, uh, with the bacteria um, you'd have to get contact. Now, if you would do an in situ, for example, well, that solution is going to take the past of least resistance. So as soon as you get into that shale, it could constantly be going into the ninth hole and it should be going into the seventh hole. You know, you can't get that coverage. It's a contact sport. You have to get the microbes to get contact to the hydrocarbon. Okay. In this case, being the creosote. Um, so if you can't get contact, you got no degradation. So very okay. difficult in the in the in so the, it'd be in difficult. But what would be the what would be the process? Because you know, at some point somebody's going to tackle. When you talk about big jobs, at some yeah. point somebody's got to tackle these big jobs. So if uh, if you got hired to do that, what what would be the approach that you'd have to take? You would have to do a little bit of shoring, you know, along the along the river. Uh, you could excavate it all. You could do it in sections, right? So, but you can excavate it all, and you can you can spray it on with the with the hose, right? You as long as you get that contact, and you can just bite off a little bit at a time. And just clean it, you know, dig it up, shore it, clean it, put it back. You know, nothing will get hauled away. You just clean it up, make sure it's good, put it back. All right. I'm gonna probably I'm gonna try to put you in touch with some of those council members in Calgary. Any sure. other any other big things that you've been that you've been looking at? Is does this lead to any other opportunities that you've seen? Or are you going to you have your hands full pretty much with this product? I, I guess I just assume that because you're on the cutting edge of innovation, that there must be other things that uh, that have the potential to to accelerate this kind of cleanup or other things that you'd be looking at? Well, yes, we've, we've looked at many different things, you know, uh, opportunities, I guess, you know, one of the business models that we look at is acquiring contaminated land, Yeah. Um, you know, treating it and, and flipping it or, you know, partnering with somebody who wants to develop it. Right. And then, and then get that land back and running. So that's kind of, that's one area that we're looking at. Um, we're also looking to, if, if, you know, if we're, if we're, our, if our phones aren't ringing, to go onto site, excuse me, then we, we, you know, we've been entertaining the idea of, of building a facility huh. and, and starting to take the contaminated soil to us. Uh, only the stuff that we can treat, you know, we're not going to take everything, you know, there's other locations for that so they can bury it and hide it. Um, but we want to treat it and then repurpose it. So, you know, we've been, we've been entertaining that idea very heavily, very strongly. Oh, I can't wait to see what your expansion plans end up looking like. It seems also to me that Alberta has a real opportunity because we have such innovation here to develop technologies that would put us as a, a world leader in being able to roll them out internationally. Are you, mm -hmm. are you seeing that too? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah absolutely. You know, be, transitioning from the crane world into environmental, you know, I've never, never thought the day that I would do that. Um, you know, doing this, you know, you get to meet a lot of people. It's very exciting. Everything's new. And just the, the brilliance of, of some of the people here in Edmonton are, are amazing. What about, uh, are you facing any issues of, uh, of labor shortages? I'm, I try to ask that with anybody who's kind of in frontline work. In fact, I, I have heard that there's going to be shortages of crane operators in a few years. So you might get tapped to, to, to moonlight to get back to your old job. But are, are you finding that it's, it's easy to, to attract people to this kind of work? You know what? Uh, yes and no. You know, we've we put a couple feelers out there, uh, you know, for more of the senior positions. Now, it's very tough to find those guys. They're they're already working. You know, any mm -hmm. good guys of what I've heard, you know, because, you know, that's not my my forte. So I, I know people in those positions and I say, hey, do you know anybody that's available? And they, that's basically their answer is no, everybody's working. Uh, you know, even juniors are pretty tough to tough to find. But the work that we do, you know, very simplistic. You know, it's it's uh, it's very simple to do. Laborer can do it. Um, I think you know we haven't had to put any ads out. Uh, people have come to us and we've just hired them. You know, they they say, hey, we we hear what you're doing. We love it. Can we join you? Let me see your resume. Okay, you're hired. 
<laughs> I love it. Yeah. Well, that's fantastic. Thank you so much for taking the time to walk us through this. I always love hearing these exciting stories of, of innovation. And uh, if there's anything that we can do to assist you, and if you've got any, any policy barriers, you mentioned the Orphan Well Association. Um, do you do any work for the Orphan Well Association? Because they do a lot of remediation. Yeah, you know, when I when I first jumped ship and started this off, I did I did write them a letter wondering, you know, asking when we would be able to uh, or can we get work? And I kind of figured out how it works. Well, there's the prime contractor list. I said, well, when are you accepting new prime contractors? Uh, we put in our our submission with another environmental company to kind of do a little tag team, uh, show that we had more resources and more people because we're both smaller companies. Um, and we were basically told that everybody does bio remediation. You know, um, it's nothing new. Well, nobody has our technology, right? So it was, it was, it was kind of uh, insulting, right? But then, you know, as we reach out more and more to the OWA, well, I'll refer to our prime contractor list. Well, you can email every single one of them on the prime contractor list, and we've only actually had one call, and uh, and it was going to go, uh, but then they ran out of budget because it was one of the bigger sites. I think it was six hundred thousand dollars for the one site, and uh, and they put us on the back burner till this coming season. So we'll see, we'll see if what happens, but if we can do 20 to 40% more sites on the same budget, I don't see why we don't. No kidding. What is this season? I, I, you know, as you put it, I guess with snow on the ground, it's not the best time to do bioremediation. You probably have a pretty short window. Yeah, there's about 140, 150 days, you know, June to October, September, October, May, June to September, October ish. The warm, yeah, they need to be warm. All right. Well, thank you so much for sharing all of this with us. And I'll, no I'll have to do a, a check in with you when you're maybe I can come out and uh, see do a site visit when you when you do an application. I'd love to see how it works. And that would be awesome. We'd love to have you for sure. Fantastic. That is Mike Myshak. He is president of the of Long Chain Reclaim. You heard a bit of his history with the Myshak group of companies, but then he got into the environmental side of things. Um, I come across these companies all the time, and I'm more than happy to give some uh, some profile to them. You saw as well in the past that we talked to Black Fly Environmental, tell you a little bit about environmental professionals. We also uh, talked to Perspectum, who's doing that really cool drone technology to be able to detect methane emissions. I think that we do have an advantage in Alberta. That we've got innovators, we've got tech, we've got people who've got deep experience in the industry who uh, just want to put things back the way they found them. So if you have any suggestions for me to do similar types of interviews like this, by all means, send me a note, danielle at albertaenterprisegroup.com. That's it for me for today. We'll be back at it again next week. Thanks so much for tuning in.